Hello, I'm Steve Statch, Chief Scientist here at Austin American Technology, and I'm here today to uh, continue the uh, ongoing uh, discussion we have on rose testing, and this will be part two on how to select a new and better rose testing extraction solvent. First off, what is the need for the new solvent? Let's talk about that for just a second. The, you know, 40, 50 years ago, whenever this method was developed, the rose method, the primary flux, and really the only flux that was available at the time was a rosin-based flux that was hand-soldered or wave-soldered onto a board. And since then, quite a bit has changed. We have new types of fluxes, no clean uh, low residue, no clean high residue. We have water-soluble fluxes. We have many different kinds of fluxes, most of which are not necessarily even rosin-based anymore. They go through a much more aggressive heat cycle than they used to. They go through a longer heat cycle, and they may go through repetitive heat cycles where we heat them up over and over again. The end result is the residues we deal with today are much different than the residues we dealt with 50 years ago. And because of this, we need to look at a new solvent for extracting these residues and measuring the amount of ions left on a circuit board. To do this properly, uh, we need to look at the IPC standards, and the current IPC standards and uh, TM650 uh, call out for a mixture of isopropyl alcohol and water. And as I mentioned earlier, the rosin-based fluxes, which were used many years ago, work just fine with the, the isopropyl alcohol and water mixtures. But the newer fluxes, the ones that go through multiple heat cycles, are, you know, just don't work. Basically, with the isopropyl alcohol and water, rarely do they work. And it leaves white residues behind. It doesn't do bulk removal. It really only looks at the surface residues when we're using these types of solvents today on modern fluxes. So this leaves us with the need for a new solvent and one that is tuned to the uh, chemistry and the physical properties of the residues that we have on circuit boards today. So if we're going to look for another solvent, what are we going to look for? We're going to look for, first of all, we're going to look for a solvent that will dissolve the residue that we want to measure. Now, there's a secondary consideration that's very important also. And that is we want to pick a solvent that will not affect the other materials on the circuit board. We don't want labels coming off. We don't want organic materials melting. We don't want, you know, glass seals cracking or corrosion occurring or anything like that. We don't want those kinds of things to happen to the materials that the products made out of. In addition to that, we want to select the solvents for good safety parameters such as flammability, toxicity, you know, stability, reactivity, and those kinds of parameters. If we end up with a, the right solvent, then what we're going to have is we're going to take off the bulk flux residues off of the circuit board or the other materials of concern, and we're going to end up with a clean board without the materials that the board's constructed of being affected. So what parameters would we want to look for in looking for a new rose extraction solvent? The primary parameter, of course, is, is one of solubility. We want the new extraction solvent to dissolve those materials and those soils of concern to us. And that would be the fluxes, the finger soils, plating solutions, and things like that and that we might worry about being left on the board. In effect, we want to take the fluxes off and we don't want to affect the surrounding materials, as you can see in this before and after uh, photo here. So that's what we're after when we're looking for a new solvent or rose extraction. All right, in order to understand the solubility properties of materials and solvents, we kind of have to take a look at the physical properties that really govern this. And there really are three physical properties related to the materials, the, either the materials, the solid materials, the materials of construction, or the solvents, or the residues. There's three properties that are common to all that determine the solubility. The first property is its hydrogen bonding parameter. If it's a strong hydrogen bonder or a weak hydrogen bonder, that is important. Uh, hydrogen bonding is basically things where you have a molecule and it is attracted to uh, with a negative charge on the molecule, uh, either an oxygen-containing molecule or something like that, which has a negative charge, and that is attracted to another molecule where there's a hydrogen extending that has a relative positive charge, and that's referred to as hydrogen bonding. 
Second parameter is dipole forces. And a dipole is basically like a permanent magnet locked into a molecule. The most notable example being water molecule, where we have the hydrogens displaced in a downward angle relative to the oxygen, creating a separation in the negative charge on the oxygen and the positive charges on the hydrogen. And so it either has a strong dipole or it has a very weak dipole a particular material might have. And the final parameter is the dispersive force. This is a little more difficult to understand in terms of concept. And think of it in terms of the molecules being long strings of spaghetti-like materials or short pieces of spaghetti. And this is the property of those molecules interacting with each other, basically entangling the molecules together on a spot-by-spot -spot charge basis. And that is referred to as the dispersive force uh, between the molecules. Those three parameters determine uh, the solubility of any material in a solvent or a, or a solid in a solvent. In 1967, Charles M. Hansen put together these three parameters in his doctoral thesis into what we now call Hansen solubility parameters. And in the next chart here, we're going to look at the Hansen solubility parameters, the dispersive, the hydrogen bonding, and the dipole forces for various solvents. And as you look at this solvent list here, you can see that we have some common solvents used to clean circuit boards and metals and things like that. Starting with the dispersive force, we see that water is the lowest dispersive force overall. It entangles less with the molecules and interacts with the molecules less than the other uh, clean solvents we see in the list. And some of those have quite high dispersive force. For example, in methylperilidone, has an 18 on, on the scale. And most of these range between zero and about 25 on a high in terms of the arbitrary scale that's set up for Hansen solubility. The polar forces that we see here for the solvents, uh, or water, it's absolutely the highest, as we would expect it to be, you know, water being the most polar solvent that we have. And the other solvents are less polar, down to the hydrocarbons, which have no polarity at all, 0.0. .0. In the hydrogen bonding force uh, section, we see that we have some materials here with good hydrogen bonding. Of course, water has very good hydrogen bonding. And, you know, the hydrocarbons, again, are very low, and uh, so are things like delimonene and things like that. So, again, the parameters change quite a bit on these three parameters for solvents. Materials have Hansen solubility parameters just like the solvents do. And as we look at the parameters for selected materials that we have, we look at this chart, we can see that, you know, the materials of construction that we'd normally build uh, our uh, circuit board out of have a lot different parameters, let's just say, than the solvent parameters we looked at earlier. The epoxy has a very high dispersive force in the 20s, and so uh, does a lot of the other materials that we use to build our products out of. And the hydrogen bonding forces even go negative on things like isoprene isomers and things like that. The polar forces can go negative as well, for example, with the polyamide. So we see a lot of difference in the, the materials of construction than we do in the solvents. That's a good thing because that would indicate that we're not going to affect these materials in general. But we want to look at specific matches between solvents that we might be considering and the materials we will be using on our circuit board to make sure we do have good separation and that gives us confidence that we won't interact or affect those materials. Now with flux residues, we really just can't go look them up in a, in a table like we are with the materials and the solvents. We have to go determine the parameters in the laboratory or in, through testing. And the reason is, is because each one of those flux residues, the solubility of that residue is dependent on the heat cycles and the age of that flux residue. So if it has gone through a very high temperature heat cycle, it's going to be more difficult to remove than a low temperature heat cycle. And if it's gone through multiple heat cycles, it's going to be more difficult to remove than a single heat cycle. So what we have to do is we have to create those residues that we want to know uh, how to dissolve by making them up through a heat cycle, take those residues and put them into known little jars of known solvent where we know the Hansen solubility parameters. And then we leave them in that solvent and we agitate them a little bit 
over time, and we see what dissolves, what solvents do dissolve the residues, and what solvents don't dissolve the residues. And by that, we can then determine by that interaction between the solvents approximately where the Hansen solubility parameters for that residue is. And through software available today, you can actually pin it down uh, to exactly where it is in the regions that it is. So if we look at the, some of the flux residues in this table right here that we have previously measured by this method, we have several no cleans, no clean one through five basically, and then we have a lead free, a couple lead frees and a couple water solubles. And if you look at the Hansen solubility parameters for those uh, fluxes that we determined, you can see that uh, some of them are very plastic-like. For example, no clean number one has a dispersive force of almost 25. That's very similar to plastics that we don't want to damage and we don't want to affect. For example, in uh, no clean number uh, five, we have a lower uh, dispersive force and the water soluble is even lower as well. So there we have solvents that we looked at in previous charts, which match up quite well with those fluxes. And that's what we're looking for in selecting a solvent to match the flux. So some of them are going to be tough. The ones that are really plastic-like, you're going to have a hard time picking a solvent and getting it to dissolve that residue without affecting the other materials. So in those cases, we're going to have to add energy and that will expand what we call the fuzzy ball, which we're going to talk about next. So now if we take this uh, Hansen solubility data and we plot it three-dimensionally on three axes, we call this, by the way, Hansen solubility space. So in that plot, we're going to see that we have the solvents plotted in there. We know what the values for the solvents were, and they're indicated by the little dots, the red and the blue dots. The green large circle that you see here is the interaction zone between the flux and those solvents. In the case we're looking at here, it was not a very soluble uh, flux residue, one that was plastic-like and very difficult to remove. And there were only, you know, just a very few solvents that really interacted with that flux. And those are shown in blue, the solid blue being that it did definitely dissolve it in the fuzzy blue balls being the ones that just interacted that maybe softened it or didn't completely dissolve it, but did interact. The red balls being the ones that didn't interact at all with it. When we look at different fluxes, we can go from a difficult to remove flux like this to one that's a more moderate flux, one that's easier to remove. And we see that that ball expands out, that interaction zone expands out. Now, instead of just one or two solvents interacting, we have five or six solvents interacting. The interaction zone has expanded significantly, so potentially there's a lot more solvents that could work with this flux. And if we want to further expand that interaction fuzzy ball, the green ball, we can add energy to the system, heat energy or physical energy, which would further expand out and bring in even the ones that were marginally on the fringe of that, that green interaction zone into the the possible choices that we want to make for our new rose testing solvents. In summary, we have talked about the need for a new rose extraction solvent. The one that's been used for the last 45 or 50 years is isopropyl alcohol and water, and that works great with the rosin-based flux. The modern fluxes we use today, the no cleans, the other soils that we're concerned about, even down to detergent residues left on the board, we have to worry about those, and we have to be able to dissolve those in order to measure those in the rose test. So this methodology we've laid out here today using Hansen solubility parameters to select a new extraction solvent is the way to go. It is the shortest way and the best way to pick the right solvent that will work in this new process. Not only will it measure the residue, it would also clean the circuit boards more effectively than the, the uh, isopropyl alcohol and water does today. So I thank you very much for your attention. I uh, look forward to uh, seeing you in our next uh, film, which will uh, discuss the calibration of a new solvent system once you've selected it, so you can get truly uh, good analytical results out of that test method. Thank you very much, and if you have any further questions, feel free to contact us at Austin American Technology or at the phone numbers that you see here below. Thank you again. Have a good day.